right, here we go with chapter eight, which is transport across membranes. And this first slide is just to remind you that there's lots of types of transports mechanisms. So lots of vocabulary, but the nice thing is most of it pretty much makes sense. So you can kind of figure out the definition from the uh, terms, which is not true for a lot of biology, I've noticed. Anyways, um, look through your chapter objectives. There are some specific transport mechanisms I want you to be sure you understand, um, like the GLUT1 and the ion exchanger and the sodium potassium pump, so make sure you go through chapter objectives. Okay. So, first, make sure you understand what a concentration gradient is. And a concentration gradient means there's a difference in the number of molecules on either side of a membrane. At least that's the definition for um, our class, okay, because we're all about the membrane. So you can see that here inside the cell has a higher concentration gradient, and on this picture outside the cell has a higher concentration gradient of these little orange dots, whatever they are, right? And the concentration gradient is an important driving force for where molecules are going to move. Because if you remember, molecules like to end up in what we call equilibrium. Equilibrium, right? Where, no, oh, I don't know what I just did where there is um, an equal number of molecules on each side of the membrane and they move back and forth. That really doesn't happen much in cells. And because cells are selectively permeable, we, or the cells, can move molecules away from equilibrium. So we can concentrate nutrients or we can get rid of waste things like that. But by nature, the chemical driving force is one, the concentration gradient, and then you're going to see, we'll talk about it a little bit this chapter, but we'll really get into it in chapter 22, is you can also have an electrical gradient. And sometimes the gradients are called potentials. Because like I said, they are the driving force of moving molecules. So an electrical gradient means these molecules would have maybe some kind of charge, maybe a plus charge or a minus charge. And that also affects the driving force for moving those chemicals from one side of the membrane to another. In the last slide in this lecture, we will talk about how you calculate um, the effects of these gradients on transport and was is it going to take energy or not and that will be a um, Delta G okay so another set of terms we talk about with concentration gradient is we can talk about something moving up or against the concentration gradient. And if we're talking about something moving up or against the concentration gradient, you see it requires energy. It's hard to do. It's like going uphill and you're going from low to high concentration. This is going to be the section called active transport takes energy to move these molecules against their concentration gradient. 
the part of the figure below is when you're going with or down the concentration gradient, right? And that's easy, like rolling downhill. So you're going from low to high. And while this is going to be an endergonic reaction, remember these words, it means it takes energy. These can be exergonic, which means it releases energy. Or more importantly, no, okay, no energy. I really don't know why this does this. No. Oh, no, it's not going to let me erase it. No energy is required. Okay. Oh, because I'm on the wrong slide. Got it. <sighs> I tell you guys, me and technology, I used to love it when I just taught with overheads or um, on whiteboards because I don't have any of those technical issues. All right. Passive transport. Okay, so in chapter eight, we're gonna talk about active transport, port, passive transport. Passive transport, because it does not require energy, is sometimes called spontaneous. I don't like that term because it sounds like it's gonna just happen, like poof, and that's not quite true. Um, so let's just talk about it in terms of exergonic and endergonic. All right, another important concept that may be new to you is that cells have an overall negative charge, which means inside the cell, the electrochemical gradient is more negative on the inside than on the outside. And that's because all this A minus up here, all these anions, they're really representing proteins and sugars that are in your cell, even inside the nucleus. DNA and RNA have an overall negative charge. Which means that the membrane potential, and again, this is really important for chapter 22, we represent the membrane potential as V subscript M, uh, yeah, subscript, okay? The membrane potential for cells is negative. That means it's more negative on the inside than the outside. It's got an electrochemical gradient, right? So we have chemicals different concentrations, and we have charge at different concentrations. And so just FYI, this is somewhere between minus 60 to minus 70 millivolts. And again, you'll see these numbers come up when you do um, delta, G, delta G concentrations. So moving ions or molecules with charge, you have a um, driving force that is not only concentration dependent, but electrically dependent. So it's an electrochemical gradient that you have to take into um, account. One other, um, while we're talking about charge, thing I want to remind you is that polar molecules, right, have partial charges. Remember that delta? Okay, and if you're going, oh my gosh, I totally don't remember this, just remember water. Right? Water had a slight positive area and a slight negative area um, because of these polar covalent bonds. So if you talk about molecule, molecules being polar, they've got partial charges. 
and I want to contrast that with an ion that has a full charge. So not partial, but a full numeric, right? So it could have a plus one, or a minus one, or a plus two, or gosh, a minus four, depending on the ion. And we'll talk about these a little bit more, but I just want you to remember the difference between an ion and a polar molecule, because you'll see them both used um, in the descriptions. So what can cross a membrane? Well, gases. So now here we're looking at our phospholipid bilayer, and that's what we're going to focus on. A lot of these um, studies were done with liposomes. Remember those from last chapter? Little spheres of a phospholipid bilayer. I can't draw it. Okay, right, a sphere. And so you could put a liposome in different solutions and see what could cross. So gases, CO2 and oxygen, your most important gases for life, can easily diffuse. Okay, so let me write the word diffuse. Right across that membrane. They don't need any help. They don't need any proteins. They can go right through the phospholipid bilayer. Hydrophobic molecules. Even some large ones, like steroid hormones. We'll talk about this again in uh, cell signaling. Oh, I hate that. Steroids, hydrophobic molecules, can cross that phospholipid bilayer because, look, the majority of it is hydrophobic. Right? So like dissolves like, so they can go ahead and cross. A few small polar molecules, okay, a few, like water, partial charge, like ethanol, can diffuse or move right across the membrane. But as soon as you get into large polar molecules, like a sugar, charged molecules, even teeny ones, like ions, or larger ones like amino acids, those are resistant to, or the membrane, I guess, should I should say, resists those molecules crossing, and so we'll have to talk about using proteins in our membrane in order to help these things cross. So, if you're too big, if you've got a partial charge or a full charge, you cannot cross that membrane without the help of some kind of protein. And, um, well, we'll talk about I'm oh, sorry, I got it. All right, so types of transport I've alluded to. Passive is where we're going first. Passive means no energy required. It means you're going down your concentration gradient. So if you don't know this symbol, this symbol stands for concentration. Okay. And you're going, that means from high to low. After we cover passive transport, we'll cover active transport. Okay. These require energy. You're going from low to high concentration, so you're going against the concentration gradient. And bulk transport, we're going to talk about at the end of yeah, end of chapter 12. Okay, so we won't, we're not going to cover these terms right now. All right, so let's talk about passive transport. Passive transport um, terms you probably know that relate to this are diffusion. I don't know why. I hate it when people miss 
Um, I don't know why we get lazy and, and capitalize everything. Diffusion, but those terms do not need to be capitalized. Facilitated diffusion, and we'll talk about all of these. And osmosis is also in passive transport. So diffusion, I like to emphasize simple diffusion, which means you're going right across the membrane. Okay, so these purple molecules can go right across. They might be oxygen or CO2 or some hydrophobic molecule. A little water can go this way, but remember osmosis is when we're talking about the movement of water. Talking about the movement of anything else, it's diffusion or facilitated diffusion if you're talking about passive transport. Facilitated diffusion just means you need a protein. So you need to facilitate your diffusion. Right? So you can have protein channels, you can have carrier proteins. And passive transport is all high to low concentration. And what I want you to make sure you understand is it could move this way if the concentration of the purple balls becomes high inside. So in diffusion, these either simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion can move the molecules either way all depending upon where the high concentration is. The difference between a protein channel and a carrier protein, carrier, sorry, is that a protein channel, I like to think of it like a tunnel, right? It's open and things can go through. And we'll talk about that they're still specific, um, but it's different than, excuse me, a carrier protein, a carrier protein is going to change conformation, which means the protein itself is actually going to change shape. And we'll look at some examples of these. These are both considered transport proteins Okay, but just different types. So like I said, diffusion, facilitated diffusion is any kind of solute, anything that's a molecule other than water that's moving from high to low concentration. Osmosis, remember, is for water specifically and only. So it's still passive transport. And water can move through a membrane by two methods. It can move through by simple diffusion. So in fact, some water can actually move, even though it's polar, so small, right through that membrane. Most goes through facilitated diffusion. Right? which means it needs a protein that helps it cross the membrane. And this green protein is called an aquaporin. And aqua means water, porin means the channel, and a porin is made up of this thing called a, a beta barrel, is its structure. And it stays open. Okay, so we're going to talk about channels can be gated. Channels can be opened and closed, but this aquaporin stays open to allow water to move freely across it based on where the high water concentration is. You would find lots of aquaporins in a organelle, uh, organelle, an organ, like your kidneys which job is to filter the blood and get out the extra fluid and water to make urine. Mm -hmm. 
But all cells, almost all cells, have aquaporins because water is essential to life, and we need it to be able to quickly move back and forth based on the concentration. Okay, so aquaporins or porins in general are open. They're made of this beta barrel, and they allow for rapid movement of the molecules. What's interesting, I think, is that it's not just a free flow of everything. There's actually amino acids inside your beta barrel that specifically allow, in this case, water to go through. Or there's other types of porins um, that are size specific, so molecules of a certain size um, can move through. As we talk about movement of water, we also talk about tonicity. So tonicity is talking about the solute concentration. And we're always comparing one side of a membrane to the other. So this little orange guy is supposed to be a cell. And the blue outside is the external environment. And most of the time, we're, consider, co we're concerned excuse me, about what kind of environment or solution we're putting a cell into. So hyper means lots, right? Hyper kids, lots of energy. Hypertonic solution means lots of stuff. Tonic is the stuff, the solute. Oh my goodness, I need to So a hypertonic solution has lots of stuff or lots of that molecule outside the cell compared to the inside. So if this molecule, this green dot, could move through diffusion, it would move this way. Most of the time, though, we're, considered, we're concerned about water movement because our cell is controlling movement of a lot of the other molecules. But water, remember, through aquaporins can move freely. So water, let's see if I can switch colors really quick here. Water is going to move the opposite way. Right? Because if the green is the stuff and the rest is water, in a hypertonic solution, there's low water, lots of stuff, and in here, it's high water. So remember, this is a, a concept a lot of people struggled with in general biology, which is why I'm going over it again. There's only so much space, right? And if you keep it simple and say, I can either have stuff or I can have water, if I have a lot of stuff, I can only have a little bit of water. Right? And if I have a little bit of stuff, I can have a lot of water. So that's why the water concentration is opposite to the solute concentration. So in a hypotonic solution, where there's a little bit of solute, there's lots of water. So the water would be going into the cell, and the solute would be going out of the cell. And in an ideal isotonic solution, right, you have equal concentration of the stuff, the solute, and equal concentration of the water, and so everything is moving back and forth and back and forth. And remember, in an isotonic solution, it's not that nothing is moving because the concentrations are equal. It's that they're moving at equal amounts. One other thing I want to point out is that water is the most hypotonic solution you can have.
right? Especially pure water. Pure water equals zero solute. If you really just had all H2s and O's. So water is very hypotonic. And we don't want our cells into a hypotonic solution because if we look at the next slide, it says what happens, right? In a hypotonic solution, if water is being driven into the cell, the cell is going to lyse. So lyse means bust, break down, explode, or you want to say it. And if you put a cell in a hypertonic solution, so lots of stuff on the outside, a little bit of water, it means the water is going to move out and your cell is going to shrivel up and die. So we always want our cells in an isotonic solution where it's balanced with the concentration of solutes and the concentration of water. And this is where our cells are happy, our animal cells. So if you ever work with cells in a lab, you will use something called phosphate buffered saline. The phosphate is to keep the pH correct. You know, we're not talking about pH this semester, but you hopefully learned it in general biology. So pH is important for cells and proteins and everything to be happy. And saline is salt water. So when you're working with tissue culture or cells in the lab, even if you are going to um, remove them from their solution they're in, you always keep them in a phosphate buffered saline solution so that it's an isotonic solution. So if you actually accidentally resuspend your cells in water, hypertonic, I mean hypotonic, right? You're going to kill them. They're going to bust, they're going to lice open. And we actually do will do that is if we want the cells to bust open, we will put them in water. And this is true for um, animal cells, this is true for working with bacteria cells. You always want to keep them to keep them healthy in an isotonic solution. Plant cells are a little different. Right? Plant cells are happy in hypotonic solutions. They actually like to have that extra pressure of water coming in because they have a cell wall. And they like something called Turger pressure where they're a little bit full. Right? It's like going out for a good meal and your tummy hurts. Okay, That doesn't feel good for us, but for plants it allows them to stand up, reach for the sun, do photosynthesis, all that good stuff. In an isotonic solution plants actually get what we call flaccid, or I like to call the technical term, is limpy. So if you have had a stick of celery or some carrots in your fridge or lettuce a little too long, they become dehydrated, right? They've lost too much water and they become limpy or wilt. I, this summer, messed up and forgot to plant my tomato, sorry, tomato plants that I purchased and I came out a couple days later and they were all limpy and I thought oh, I should just throw them away but I decided to plant them anyways. I watered them, came back that afternoon, they were beautiful tomato plants. It was amazing. I wish I had taken before and after pictures. Luckily they didn't get too dehydrated. If you get all the way to plasmolysis, or plasmalized, plas uh, plasmolysis. This is where the plant gets so dehydrated that the plasma membrane actually starts pulling away from the cell wall. Sometimes it's hard to recover plants 
um, they'll start to die. Lysis is never a good thing when you're talking about a um, cell. So we are happy here. Plants are happy in a little bit of a hypotonic solution. Make sure you understand this relationship. If I tell you about a solution of cellas, you can understand or you can tell me, analyze, which way the water is going to move. All right, let's move away from water. Let's go to facilitated diffusion. Again, this is passive transport, high to low concentration, just with a protein helper. The protein is the facilitator and the diffusion is the high to low, right? And we've already kind of touched on this. You can have a protein channel. You can have a carrier protein. Carrier proteins are going to undergo conformational changes as it moves the molecule across the membrane channels are like um, a, a tunnel but they can also be controlled open and close and we'll talk about some of these mechanisms I want you to know that this is still selective or specific Porins are the ones that are not as specific, sometimes just specific to size. Aquaporins, though, are specific to water. But these protein channels, a lot of them are for ions, right? So we can get those charged molecules across. They're very specific. Carrier proteins, as you can imagine, very specific, right? A, the right kind of molecule has to fit into the pocket in order for the carrier protein to move it across the membrane. So let's look at a couple examples. GLUT1 transporter. This is an example of a carrier protein. If you look at the figure in the book, it shows the conformational change a little bit better, but you can see here the proteins binding glucose. Once it binds, it has a conformational change and then it releases glucose to the other side of the membrane. So in this case, what it's showing you is that the glucose is at a high to low concentration. And I told you that a lot of these transporters can go one way or the other depending upon the concentration. So what our cells do is as soon as glucose comes into the cell, it gets phosphorylated. Phosphorylation means you add a phosphate group. Now, this is no longer glucose. This is glucose 6-phosphate. So now this will not be transported back out because it's not going to fit into that specific carrier protein. And so this is a way that the cells can continue to bring glucose in and keep the glucose concentration outside the cell high because glucose 6-phosphate is not glucose. So think about that. It's a really important um, concept. Okay. This is passive transport. Right? You don't see any ATP in this diagram. This is facilitated diffusion because it's going from, oh, it just drives me crazy. I think there must be weird spots on my screen. Going from high to low concentration. And one other word term I want to throw at you is this is also an example of uniport. Uniport means one molecule type in one direction. Now yes, it can go 
the other direction, but it would go um, not at the same time. Okay, so when you're analyzing and using some of these terms, you're looking at, okay, what's happening right here in this picture? Oops, we'll erase this. Okay, and it's uniport. Glucose is coming one type of molecule, one direction. Let's look at another example. Anion exchange, or the chloride bicarbonate exchanger. These are really important in your red blood cells. This is an example, again, of facilitated diffusion, right? Because we've got our protein there. These are actually carrier proteins, but I couldn't find a really good um, picture of it. And these, I hopefully you can see that bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, is going one direction and chloride is going an opposite direction. So this is an example of antiport. Antiport means one molecule type in, one molecule type out. So they're going in opposite directions. And these guys are moving at a one to one ratio which means for every bicarb that leaves, in this case, a Cl mi minus comes in. And this keeps the ion concentration balanced. Why is this important to understand, right? So we know glucose is an important sugar for life and cellular respiration. Well, CO2 <coughs> is a big byproduct of metabolism. If you go back to your cellular respiration notes from general biology, we make a bunch of CO2. We need to get rid of that. So the CO2 goes into the red blood cells from your tissues and is converted to bicarbonate. And sometimes the bicarbonate goes back out in order to keep the pH of your blood balanced. So bicarb is really important for balancing the blood pH. Your blood pH has a very small pH range, 7.35 to 7.45. And when you go too high or too low, um, people can go into shock and die. So we want to be able to get rid of that carbon dioxide. We want to be able to make that buffer if we need it. And then with the excess carbon dioxide, we want to be able to exhale it, right? We want to get rid of that waste product. So again, we can have that bicarbonate in, turn to CO2, and in our lungs, the CO2 leaves the red blood cells and we breathe it out, right? CO2 is going to cross the membrane by simple diffusion. We've talked about that gas. The bicarbonate has to uh, move by facilitated diffusion based on wherever its concentration is higher, right, it's diffusion. And in order to maintain that ion concentration, it uses an antiport mechanism, right? So it exchanges a bicarb for a chloride ion and vice versa. So take a look at this diagram, take a look at your book. Really important to understand. I'm sure you'll learn a lot more about it in physiology. One way these um, carrier uh, proteins have been described as working is the ping pong mechanism. And again, this is just to emphasize that there's this conformational change, there's this structure change when these proteins are working. So the ping pong mechanism means as it's taking one type of molecule out, in this case, it has a certain conformation. And as it's bringing something else in, it has a slightly different conformation, right? So it goes ping pong, ping pong, ping pong, back and forth, just like if you were playing ping pong. So the and I exchange 
um, carrier protein is described as a ping pong mechanism. And so I just wanted to try to illustrate to you what that meant. All right. I'm going to go through three more slides and then I'm going to pause and make a new video so um, I can get a drink of water. All right. Gated ion channels. All right. So we've talked about a channel for um, diffusion, facilitated diffusion, like a little tunnel. But I said a lot of channels can be closed off and opened. So that's what we're talking about. A gate, just like a gate to your backyard, can be opened to let things in and closed so that nothing's crossing that gate. Gated ion channels are very selective for specific ions. And we will talk about these um, in chapter 22 again when we talk about neurons and neuron transmission. We want them to be gated because we want to control the movement of the molecules. So we don't want our ions to just keep moving because we actually need to build up concentration gradients for certain things to happen. So three, basically three types of gated ion channels, and they differentiate between what triggers them to open. So voltage gated opens based on a change in membrane potential. So you can kind of see there's a bunch of pluses and then a less plus. So a change in membrane potential is going to tell this or make this um, protein change shape and now allow ions to move across whichever way they're going to move. So voltage gated opens and closes based on changes in membrane potential, right? Changes in that electricity, that electrical difference. B and C show ligand gated channels, okay? And whether the ligand is on the inside or the outside of the cell, doesn't matter, they work the, both the same way. They have to bind a specific molecule. That's what a ligand is. And we'll talk a lot about ligands with receptors. The ligand binds to the channel proteins, they change shape and open up. When the ligand comes off, they go back and close. Mechano uh, sensitive or stress activated We call them mechanosensitive in your book. These are really um, interesting ones, and I don't honestly know a lot about them. But they sense a change in the membrane. So like pressure on the membrane. So it talks about when a membrane is deformed, right? So you could imagine like pushing your finger on a membrane. These guys will open or close. And they're actually important for, again, moving ions very specifically across. And they seem to be the channels that give us our senses. So like touch and um, hearing and some of our muscle coordination is based on these stress-activated or mechanosensitive gated ion channels. So when your ear receives vibrations from sounds, those vibrations are mechanical and they will open and close, trigger the opening and closing of certain channels. So these are found in our sensory, sensory um, organs. These, like I said, 
we'll come back to in chapter 22 with neurons. And the example of a ligand gated channel in your book is the CFTR channel, which is a chloride ion channel. Really important in helping regulate chloride concentrations, but more importantly, water concentrations. And in people with cystic fibrosis, they have a mutation in this channel that doesn't allow it to bind the ligand very efficiently, and so the channel doesn't work correctly. So make sure you read about cystic fibrosis in the um, textbook. All right, last type of ion channel I want to talk about is ATP synthase. And hopefully you remember this from general biology and cellular respiration. We're looking at the mitochondria. <clears throat> and here's your electron transport chain. And remember, as electrons move through the electron transport chain, they stimulate the pumping or the movement, I shouldn't say the pumping, the movement of hydrogen ions into this intermembrane space. And then the hydrogen ions move down their concentration gradient, so this is a facilitated diffusion through ATP synthase, that's the enzyme, remember ASE enzyme, and makes ATP, right? So super important that this outer membrane is impermeable to hydrogen ions or protons. We call them the same thing. If it got leaky, right, the H pluses would move on out and you wouldn't make any ATP. So there are drugs or um, poisons that can actually affect this and you can lose that H plus concentration gradient. You don't make ATP, you die. All right, so you got some examples. Um, we've talked about simple diffusion. We've talked about ion channels and water channels or porins. We've talked about gated ion channels that actually open and close. We've talked about moving molecules in a uniport, a symport, or an antiport. And where we're going to go with the next lecture is now talking about active transport that involves ATP. Ooh.